Okay, we are now live. So welcome everybody to talk about the venture capital outlook. And our topic is basically to talk about startup investments and the market after COVID. But uh, it looks like that we have also other topics to discuss. I don't know if people even remember COVID anymore so much. So that uh, uh, welcome everybody. And may, maybe we can start uh, 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 by discussing a little bit about the outlook and situation at the moment. That, uh, that how does it look not only for the startup investments, but for the business and economy as, uh, as a whole. I think that we have a, a lot of uncertainty, but maybe we can conclude something that uh, that uh, what we can expect. So that uh, uh, let's start. So that if 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 you can all make uh, your own comments, that how you how you see situation at the moment, and maybe Eric, you can start. So thank you very much. <clears throat> of course, the situation is a very. Um very worrying being a kind of a European citizen and, and French living in Silicon Valley. So you cannot stop thinking about the Cold War and, and, and all the pressure we've been living under uh, in the pre, uh, pre-Berlin Fall days. So very, 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 very scary. So of course, uh, in a situation like that at a high level, uh, you know, it makes Europe stronger. I think Europe was a little bit uh, challenged by their own population, their own government. And, and few people remember that uh, Europe has been the, the, the ancestor of the European community or European Commission has been a reaction against the war. It has been really, let's be aligned together so that there is no war. And it was a main, main objective of creating the European Union. So we, we are back to our roots and um, a lot of people were questioning Europe on the basis so of why do we need these things? There is no risk of war. Unfortunately, we're all reminding this is the case. So, so that's definitely a, a pretty impressive reaction of Europe. Germany reacted way faster than anybody else. Uh, even Switzerland, who has been a, a country, for those of you who know the European politics, always wanted to be shy to join the EC. is joining forces on the sanction and all the, the financial penalties. Uh, so, so that's definitely one, uh, one aspect. Uh, and of course, uh, if we move to the tech, uh, we're all feeling very sorry because all of us are investors in company uh, who have a R&D team in, uh, in Ukraine. For example, uh, one of our public company called Grid Dynamics uh, is born out of Ukraine, you know, and uh, as you can imagine, they lost two thirds of their market cap in the last few few days. But more importantly, uh, the people, uh, I mean, the management team is very busy finding buses to move people from uh, uh, Kiev and other uh, eastern city back back to the west or to Poland. And also the company has development centers in in Russia. And this is also a risk for the Russian people working for a Ukraine company. So obviously, uh, it will have also a big impact in Israel. As you know, uh, there's a deep connection between uh, Israel and Russia and Ukraine. A lot of the startup world in, in Israel has a R&D centers in uh, in Ukraine and Russia, uh, and of course, uh, all these talented software people could be called uh, in the reserves of in the Ukraine army. You know, uh, so it, it will have a kind of a significant impact on the on the on the IT business. Interesting, what we see across our portfolio is that the customers, the customer of this company, are very very uh, uh, helping, very very supportive, and uh, it seems that the customer are going to do everything to help this company depending on Ukraine to, to go through this crisis. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ritsat, maybe you can continue. Sure, thank you. Um, so the way uh, the, the world, although we thought the world had changed uh, uh, irrevocably in the last two years, we've just seen it change again in the last week or so um, in a way that is not, and, and, and conducive to good business, to good financial practices, and certainly not for the health and safety of people around the world. So um, I think from the stand of the financial markets, this kind of sea change that has happened in Europe, uh, we can't avoid it. Um, it with, with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic, 
what we saw in the United States in the venture capital investments in the last two years was an enormous increase. Um, I mean, we uh, over three hundred billion dollars last year in the United States invested in VC by quarter four. So we saw this massive increase during the pandemic. Uh, a lot of it to do with fintech, a lot of it to do with healthcare, etc. Um, and now, I mean, I, I was mentioning before, I spoke with a very high-level senior uh, ex-minister of defence uh, recently, just a few days ago, and. They had canned speeches for what was going on in terms of um, um, financing of different types of new types of uh, technology, not not weaponry, but things like energy and stuff like that. And they they said that their canned speech, as of last Thursday, got thrown out the window. There is no more canned speech. Everything has changed, and uh, the militaries of the world and the Western world in particular, looking for big, borrow, steel, liberate any equipment they can. And I think the sluice gates are going to open in terms of uh, um, funding for lots of different things that will support our people, our troops. Uh, and I'm not just talking weaponry uh, at all because I'm not involved in that at all. I mean, I'm involved in energy systems for one of my things, but also in space systems. That's my primary. And um, we've seen a huge upset in the last few days, the Russians were rattling their saber about IS International Space Station, about supplying rocket engines to the United States for uh, certain companies. So this is going to be a big upset. This is going to change things dramatically. You know, shades of 1939, 38, 39, unfortunately, except with nukes. So um, I'm not quite sure what's going to happen. I, I did have an idea of what I thought was going to happen post-COVID. But this last week has really changed everything. So I'm not quite certain at this point. I think the money will still be coming in. It'll be coming from different areas and different arenas and people will be starting to put their focus in different technologies. But uh, it's going to be a little bit of a, um, an interesting time to figure out exactly which way the, uh, the pathway is over the next few months. Thank you. Anne, can you continue? Yeah, not to repeat what uh, anyone has is saying um, a good venture capitalist will tell entrepreneurs that there is no bad time to start a company. And that's always true. Um, in addition to the geopolitical issues, which are massive right now, uh, for many, maybe not all of us on the panel, this would be the first time that most entrepreneurs have experienced inflation. Uh, I do want to remind people that Microsoft and Apple both started in 75 and 76 when inflation was over 9%. Uh, but that will affect uh, the customer base. Um, second, we have a massive talent shortage, and we depended upon having access uh, to talent globally, uh, including you know, many of many developers in the Ukraine. Uh, we were pitched a company last week uh, that was an exciting startup, uh, but then they did mention that their developers are all in the Ukraine. Certainly that does not put them at the top of the investment stack right this very moment. There is enormous amount of what we call dry powder out there in the hands of traditional venture capitalists and now private equity who have become even more traditional venture capitalists. Uh, also, in budgeted accounts of corporations, uh, it will be interesting to see how corporate investment holds out here uh, across industries. Uh, and, but at the same time, uh, it looks like in 2022, there'll be enormous amount of capital for startups. To close, I would say that the real issue here is exit paths. Uh, likely M&A will continue. Uh, there's a ton of that in process. We've seen a couple exits already this year in our software portfolio. We are only software investors. Uh, but companies have, uh, have a higher bar to go public. In the last five years, they've become about 11 to 12 year olds versus eight year olds before that. Uh, so we have a huge, num huge number of unicorns in the world that expect it to be public companies this year or the next. Uh, right now, I'd, I don't think I'd want to be going public this very day. 
because uh, we have a tremendous volatility everywhere, including in our markets. Okay, thanks. And Crickory. Sure, thank you. Yeah, again, not to not to repeat what my esteemed panelists have, have mentioned, but I, I come at this from two two sides. One as the, the head of a tech focused investment bank that helps companies on the exit side, so the M and A piece, um, <clears throat> and then also as non exec chair of an emerging market tech focused private equity fund. So on the investor side, and so. Picking up on some of Anne's points, I think w one of the things we saw last year was historic M&A volume, $5 trillion, of which about a trillion plus was in tech and about a trillion plus was private equity backed acquisitions. So we saw this huge um, wave of liquidity for exits in addition to IPOs and, and, and other paths um, that I think also spurred a lot of new investment at the venture stage because when venture capitalists and entrepreneurs are looking, they're looking, you know, they're looking to the exit. Um, I think um, M and A in what we've seen um, has actually maintained or even had an uptick. Probably there'll be a replacement factor of companies less focused on IPO or or additionally less focused on doing another growth round and maybe just looking for a home in a larger entity um, to de-risk themselves um, as, as a path. So I think that factor will play into um, that factor will play into new investment across tech. I think the panelists have already covered a lot that's going on geopolitically. I can certainly in subsequent questions share some of my thoughts, but certainly some of the investments that the private equity fund I chair is involved in indeed as one of the panelists mentioned, um, with teams in Ukraine and whatnot, are frankly spending their time getting their employees to the border and out rather than running their business. Um, and I think that's to be expected from a humanitarian perspective, but the reality on the ground that will happen in the coming weeks or months. Yeah, thank you. I know that it's very hard to make any predictions in this point, but maybe one specific question I wanted to ask that if we think the Cold War time, there were a lot of tech companies that basically developed technology for the defense industry uh, to governments. And I think that what happened in early 90s was that many of those companies yeah. after the Cold War then basically to became to develop other applications based on the technology they had originally done for the defense industry. What is your feeling at the moment that, uh, that do you see that the defense technology, defense industry could have impact on the startup market now when there are opportunities, as we know, Germany is going to put 1 billion euro more money in mili military spending and probably many other governments also put more money. And uh, I think that many tech companies might see also opportunities there. Well, I would say that many industries in the many tech industries have started by support from the tech industry, the internet alone. Uh, if we look at space tech investing, which is becoming a large category in itself, most of the revenue uh, for these companies is through government contracts. And many of them have uh, a defense linkage as well. Uh, those That set of companies is just getting into their first sets of commercial accounts. We look at embedded systems uh, and how, where they rose from, those really started with government support as well. So I think we'll see a virtuous circle here <coughs> uh, from new sectors, the established companies, um, all, all of our companies in the software sector set up a government division fairly early on now, uh, because that is part of the global markets. And most of, um, many of these government contracts are not a one off thing. They really do lend to commercial innovation. The R and D that, uh, software, the R and D budgets that, uh, the largest software companies have are 
greater than our R&D budget for the United States. So I think there's enormous amount of R&D already being done by the likes of uh, the large technology companies um, as a whole. But it, it's not so much that government stands apart from the commercial ent entities. Uh, you know, it, I think that's really the same in Israel these days. It's, it's a very integrated market opportunity, but certainly it does enhance the budget field for all these companies. Yeah, yes, I would add that uh, uh, on top of what I said, there's already a, uh, an industry which is really fueled by the government spending uh, is a cyber, uh, cyber security. Yes. The whole cyber security is already pretty much linked to government. Now, usually it's more defense than attack, but we all know there's still a lot of attacks <laughs> for this technology. And it's obvious that the, the cyber security uh, sector is going to, to see a big explosion of demand because it's, it's part of the modern warfare. Now, that's one. The other aspect, and uh, uh, the semiconductor industry, which has been a sector uh, totally underinvested by the US uh, private equity and venture on the basis that it was not worth competing, the Chinese will win. Is coming back. You know, the U.S. government is funding a lot of fab, but it's pretty obvious that we we'll only accelerate this trend because uh, all this equipment they need semiconductor uh, system, and not only uh, the innovation has slowed down in, because of lack of funding in U.S. and Europe because of the threat of China, but we are at some more existential point where the fab are threatened. You know, TSMC, it's the largest fab in the world. Or the largest supplier in the world is in Taiwan under a potential threat. The number two is Samsung, which is okay. Korea is okay, but they are just a, a few seconds away from some North Korea south. So the whole semiconductor industry is going to be fueled by this demand because it's needed, but also securing the manufacturing. And we should not forget that emerging more software technology like AI, computer visions, right. still use a lot. Uh, that would certainly uh, stimulate the demand without talking about quantum computing. Uh, at the end of the day, quantum computing is fundamentally optimization, how you optimize a very complex uh, you know, situation, and obviously uh, defense is one of them. So it is going to really, really... I think a side effect coming back to Europe. Europe was a little bit, a bit uh, tentative and not well organized uh, to push their... Uh, uh, technology industry, they, despite a lot of grant of the European government, I think it may also give the impetus to Europe to be a bit more organized in the tech business, uh, you know, which I think is a plus because there's a lot of talent there. So that, that would be also an important uh, effect. You know, if you take a big defense contractor like Thales, it's amazing how in the last uh, five years, they diversify in a lot of things like logistics and AI and all these things. So this is going to have a big effect on the tech business. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, th those are actually very interesting points, especially China uh, situation in Taiwan. Uh, as I, I was just reading also how much semiconductor business is actually in Taiwan. And may maybe we could also conclude... I have been this week in Mobile World Congress here in Barcelona and looked companies like Huawei and, and those guys, and it is amazing what they are doing. So, so that I think that the, if we talk about the competition between countries, it's especially China. Russia has its own nuclear weapons, but otherwise if we talk about high tech and these kind of things, they cannot do anything. And to, to, to your earlier point, Yoko, um, what I was going to say about the defense industry and financing in the United States, there has been a huge paradigm shift. Um, we at Starbridge, we invest in space technology and space-based dual-use technologies. And of course, in a lot of space uh, industry, there's, there's, there's a, a national security uh, angle or aspect to space. There always is, there always will be. Um, so, but we always look at it in terms of when we're talking about investing in a company, you know, who's your client, who's your client, who's your client. It's okay to have government as a client as long as they're not your only client. And so we want to know who client two, three, four, five, and six are. 
So that, that, that's one thing that we do when we look at this. But I would like to point out that there's, there's an interesting change in the last 20 years or so in that both NASA in particular, but also the Department of Defense is much more interested and I'm separating weapon systems away from this now. I'm talking about everything else. Much more interested in uh, being able to buy a commercially proven technology and product that's come out of uh, um, venture capital supporting a new idea, a new innovation, that being uh, uh, accredited or validated by a commercial uh, clients, and then they will buy it in in in, uh, in large quantities if that's what they need. So rather than them going to try and reinvent the wheel, they're leaning much more into the innovation that comes in from the tech sector and, and, and the private sector. And that's a huge change that we've seen in the last 20 years that, that is how that has um, changed uh, government procurement. Any, any other comments for this? Uh, we little bit talk about the IPO market, and I understood that you felt that maybe this year is not a good time uh, to go public. <laughs> what is your feeling that if companies start to postpone their IPOs and, uh, and maybe the IPO market is getting more difficult, what could be the impact on the venture capital market as a whole? I, I mean, earlier phase investments and also investments in VC funds. You know, I'm sure. I'm yeah, I mean, I can try to say. That. Please go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. No, no, I, I can. Yeah, my network's a little unstable. So if I'm, if you can't hear me, um, I can let another panelist speak. But. Um, I think if one looks at the statistics historically, while IPOs are the sort of glamorous and sexy exit for investors and entrepreneurs, and by the way, it's not day one an exit because there's a lockup, but while that's, that's the high profile exits, the majority of venture backed companies um, exit through an M&A transaction, whether that's to a strategic or, or a private equity group. And so um, there's been ebbs and flows in how volatile the IPO market has been if one looks at charts throughout history for tech IPOs. And so um, there's normally a substitution effect that um, corporate or private equity exits will displace IPO exits um, in times when the public markets are more shaky. I think the other element, though, is if the IPO market or the public markets in general for tech are impaired, whether that's um, growth rates for you know tech overall, whether that's you know geopolitical issues, that does have a knock-on effect on exit values in M and A because corporate M and A will still look to the public markets for valuation um, valuation benchmarks, and so um, you know it, it, it's less an issue of can one get out of these these transactions, but more. Um, more related to uh, more related to valuation. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are a number of issues here. One is, uh, of course, the valuation is issue. We've already seen multiples change in most industries, and where will they stabilize? Uh, many of these companies that have taken large funding rounds are on what we call the growth model. Is that they've got a a runway to cash flow break even. So the use of cash uh, and how much growth you should drive and how you build these companies from scratch is ultimately driven by the liquidity models. And the liquidity models today or yesterday, 2021, where people were investing in growth stocks. Uh, and while they did want to see what the business model was and how that business model stabilized, growth was valued over that. And if that changes, it, it's, it's sort of a pivot for all of us on our growth stage companies. Ultimately, um, you know, funds have uh, lifetimes as well. Uh, and also employees have lifetimes. You know, if you've been at a company since the start for 11 years and all of a sudden your, your stock options are 
are underwater, uh, you probably start looking around. So, we, you know, the in most of these tech companies, uh, the most important assets are the intellectual capital, not the financial capital, and that is in scarce supply. So how jittery it makes the people at these companies and whether they start moving around from the ones that were headed towards uh, a big exit in the public markets or some other way, or companies uh, or not determines how long they stay there. Also, it does change the cadence of investing. You might have a company that's five years old uh, and Last year, if you got an acquisition offer for that company, you might have tried really hard to convince that company to keep going because you knew their TAM was huge, that it's another five years before they uh, before they would go public, but they have a huge opportunity. You might think twice about that as well as the founders of that company who are entertaining that offer. So it does sort of shake things up on the people front, how the businesses are built, uh, how we look at M&A opportunities, uh, because really in the last two years, the the IPO window is so wide open for high-valued companies at such high multiples that everyone won, whether you were having a company acquired or you waited to take them public. That's not true right this very moment. The only comment I could add, because everything has been well said on the company and the market, is more now on the people investing in the venture firm. Uh, I would say, especially early stage, uh, um, I'm part of a managing director of an early stage fund. Usually the savvy investor in venture capital, they invest in us because we are decorated from the public market. So at least on the early stage side, there will still be an influx of capital. Because people lack the diversification and they know it's an option on, on the market, you know, four, five, six, seven years down the road. So at least for the early stage people, uh, or at least venture fund, it's good. Uh, you know, there will be certainly a push to more early stage investment. Now, obviously, the impact of the people who are raising a very less stage f- uh, fund too close to the to the public market. And that's, by definition, a bit more complex. Now I would like to make a comment, which I think is linked to the COVID. Uh, we are an, entre- uh, an investor in the enterprise, B2B space. And I think the, the digital transformation of the enterprise has only been accelerated by COVID. Uh, a lot of uh, executives uh, in these various industries, whether it's high tech or banking, or even more or less shiny uh, industry like mining or insurance, they really, really believe in technology now. They see the cloud at work. There was a lot of doubt with the cloud. The fact they send their employee working at home overnight, they see the cloud at work and they discover that the cloud is giving them the flexibility to readjust their business. I just give an example of the post-COVID world, the readjustment of the supply chain, the explosion of logistics and e-commerce. All these things are happening thanks to the cloud. So there is still a secular trend, which is will not stop. And people forget that even if we talk about, you know, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, whatever, this is a real fundamental in, invention like the transistor. You know, when this transistor was invested by Texas Instruments in the late 60s, the real benefit pop up in the early 70s with Intel and so forth. So I think we have to think that this, uh, this first wave of artificial intelligence and data even if it's all over the, the paper, we are still at, at the beginning. Uh, and there is a massive trend of pushing the new technology out. And, and all this innovation and new business and so forth will continue uh, independently of, of, the, of the market cycle. And as we say, this crisis in uh, Ukraine will stop. We don't know if it will stop in two quarters or in three years or one year, but it will stop. Uh, and this technology and this product will be there. <clears throat> Yoko, um, what I was going to say to you about the exit uh, and IPO strategies, um, I think there's a fundamental change that is a, is occurring in the venture capital world. I mean, we all know it's happening. It's been happening for quite a few years. The old model doesn't seem to work anymore. I mean, we've seen huge changes of, of steerage, like from Sequoia, um, changing their model, um, where 
And I think that this comes from, there's, there's two things that are driving this. One is because there's so much money chasing good deals. Uh, there's, there's not a lack of capital out there. It's trying to find the right deal. But those right deals are, are pushing the valuations much higher. Partly they're being pushed higher because of earlier entry into those deals. So uh, VCs are getting in more closer to the seed level. And so that's driving valuations as well. So you're seeing these uh, valuations being pushed up. Um, there's talk about permanent capital. There's talk about closed-end funds these days. And then, of course, there's always the uh, the 800-pound gorilla. We look back in the SPAC market over the last um, two years. And to see, you know, how will the SPAC market wash out? I think it's going to have to be better run, better managed by the sponsors. Um, you know, the uh, it, it's it's been... If you have a good SPAC with good managers, good sponsors that start them, it's not a bad deal. But a lot of a lot of them are not. You know, they they create these these you know open check companies and they don't know what they're looking for. And then you you get every all the investors pulling out um, redemptions right away. They want out. And uh, and so I, I think that there's there is this massive change with all of these different things going on. Um, that's going to you know uh, and does that make M and A more likely? Um, usually in our industry, the space industry, M and A has been the thing, but we're not seeing that so much anymore. We're not seeing like the Boeing's and the Lockheed's buying a lot of these smaller companies. Yes, they still do, but not at the same level that they seem to do in the past. Actually, actually we have one question from audience also that is linked to this, and it's basically that uh, uh, what we think when some some of these private unicorn companies have a higher valuation than similar publicly listed companies. Uh, what could be in, in impact of, of, of that situation in longer run? It's a really good question because if you think about it, you look at Elon Musk's companies, and I mean, I know Tesla's pr- public, But when you think about it, Tesla is not a car company. It's a technology company. It's an AI company. It's a robotics company. And it's linked to a satellite company. Uh, you know, So uh, I understand where people will see that. Because you look at SpaceX now, it's one of the highest priced private companies around because it's doing things that um, you know nobody else is doing. And believe me, I've been trying to get on the SpaceX cap table for ages. It's not easy. Um, so you are seeing some of these... Uh, you know, private capital is prepared to throw any money at some of these good deals. Uh, I mean, with SpaceX in particular, they can raise billions in a in the space of a few hours if they wanted to. You know, the the other uh, as we tell our companies, uh, the valuations, private valuations, are irrelevant to the most part, other than the selling of secondary shares. Uh, which is a invisible market that is is real for many of these large companies. Uh, usually, when companies do get to their growth stage round, uh, there is a provision to allow all employees to sell a certain amount of their shares, uh, so that they'll continue on this long over decade march to become a real public company or even to increase their their public valuation in in an M&A. So there is where the valuation may be meaningful to uh, a founder or an employee uh, for liquidity events along the way. Uh, that liquidity event usually does not benefit the, the investors who stay the course. Uh, but for the most part, um, In early stages, valuations are pretty artificial. Uh, it really is, do you have the right partners? Do you have the right amount of capital to get you to the next risk reduction point? And do you have the right business model that can leverage that capital over time? Okay, thanks. Maybe one more question about uh, this IPO market and uh, basically is uh, availability of the money that when basically the IPO market is hot and uh, investors can see that uh, 
that they are certain areas that you can make IPO quite fast. At the same time, maybe it means also that there might be some other companies, for example, early phase companies that are doing something, could I say, more disruptive or a little bit more complex that, that is not really on the IPO track. Do you see that if IPO market comes more complex, that actually there could be more interest also in those areas where IPO is, is not so visible yet, but maybe they could uh, create something more disruptive and some longer term solutions? Any comment for that? That's why they call us venture capitalists. Uh, yeah, but but you know that many people are sometimes skeptical with that 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 it's not always so disruptive and long term thinking. Yeah, I mean, the there is always the question: Is the market owned by uh, an incumbent? Or is there room for a new company? Um, and you, I would say, and I I bet you Eric would admit to this too that if we look back to investing mistakes where we turned a company down, it was probably because we feared an incumbent uh, versus we're worried about the company executing. And you know, it really is looking at the total available market. Uh, you know, timing is everything. Many of these incumbents do age out of the market before their their star fully rises. But um, it, it probably is the hardest part of being an investor is determining when it is a crowded market, should we enter or move on to other markets? Yeah, and to, and to support what I'm saying, uh, you have a lot of cases where, uh, you know, it's, it's not only the, the, the first entrant in the market that we, you know. Yes. Uh, and also we shouldn't forget that even incumbent or large incumbent have their own issue. And sometimes they are, uh, they leave opportunity just for internal management issue. And, you know, I think the incumbents sometimes have their own challenge that sometimes a startup can, can really uh, uh, take advantage of. Now, coming back to um, the issue, will the startup have, have an advantage? I think what's happening when there is abundance of capital and when uh, the funding is, let's say, pretty easy, like we experienced in the last two or three years, it is also degrading the quality of the new entrants because it's very tempting for new teams to try, even if for plenty of reasons they are not necessarily ready. So it makes our job a bit more difficult because there are so many companies coming and some are just me too, a follower, or, or, or just want to have a try. So it's also unfortunately crowding, crowding this market. Yeah, I think another part of uh, startups, too, is, you know, if we look at the size of some of the large public companies, a Microsoft, a Google, an Amazon, you'd think, why would I invest in any software company? But it's really a, a, a world of frenemies where people are have to partner with each other, uh, have to find leverage from the incumbents. Uh, can look at those platforms as look at them as hyper growth platforms versus, you know, market owners. So it's it's a very different story. When we started our first venture firm, we were the first venture firm to invest in software. It was total frontier. Uh, that's not the case anymore. So the way you look at a company is how they do find leverage with the incumbents as well as create their own market opportunity. Also, customers are really, really smart these days. They have strong engineering teams as well. So the voice of the customer plays a lot in our due diligence. You know, do you really have a need here? Uh, how much would you spend at, at it? Does it show up in your budgets in the next couple years? So that's been a dynamic that's changed considerably in the last decade, that it's we're not selling things to customers we're collaborating with customers. Thanks. We have about five minutes left so that I have a, uh, two more questions if all of you can comment this. The first one is the easy one. That what, what, is the, what is the area that you feel will be the most interesting in the venture capital market uh, during the next year? 
And then the more difficult one question is that we have now got pandemic and war in Europe. What is the next unexpected thing? Eric, can you start? You want me to say, oh my God. So I think what is the most unexpected things is that there will be some smart entrepreneur somewhere that will create an unexpected product. And everybody will say, oh my God, why has nobody thought about it? <laughs> okay. So, so, uh, so this is a, an, this, this things will happen for sure, even if it's not an, unexpected. So, no, um, uh, stopping, <laughs> you know, it's kind of a little joke that I, I think despite the war, despite all these things, uh, the human creativity is there. The, the real asset of venture capital is not money, it's basically this human talent and, and creativity. So being a B2B investor, I still believe we're at the beginning of this uh, AI, machine learning, deep learning. It, because if you look at it technology-wise, you know, it happens to myself, my personal uh, experience has been a three wave of that. The last, the first wave was in the late 80s, nine, early 90s, and the late 90s. When you see what happened today, all these things are, are happen just by the massive amount of uh, processing power, the cloud, and the massive amount of data gathered. But nothing has been really done on the innovation and algorithm and tools and so forth. So, so really, we haven't seen really, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. So that's one area we're pretty excited. Still a lot of things to be done. The other area in the enterprise is really the enterprise model. Uh, we all know where we're coming from. But the cloud is obviously fabulous, but it's still a centralized model. So uh, the, the the enterprise software infrastructure will be more and more decentralized. You can, you know, whether it's built on blockchain or something like that, but all this W3 is real because the centralization of the system, even their cloud base, is, is kind of reaching its limit to some extent. And there is really a brand new wave to build uh, the software infrastructure. And, and, we're, and we're in a world, uh, you know, where uh, flexibility and decentralization is important. Why? If you think about it, Internet has been created as a, as a fear of the nuclear war. Remember, Internet and IP were created. How you create a reconfigurable network should you get a bomb somewhere? I think the enterprise learned with COVID and now, unfortunately, with Ukraine, that they have to reconfigure themselves very quickly. Supply chain reconfiguration. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, uh, China re supply chain reconfiguration now Ukraine. So I think the the, the enterprise will have to organize. So, sorry, I think that I must interrupt you because we have two two oh, more minutes. So so that maybe yeah. Rich, that you can comment quickly. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, I was going to very quickly say we have plague, war, famine caused by climate change. Where's the rain of frogs and the rivers flowing red next? I think hmm. I'm going to continue to invest in what we know best from a technical standpoint as well as a financial standpoint in space tech we are very bullish on space tech we think that uh, there's going to be a huge paradigm shift in the whole space tech industry in the next two years thanks and uh to be uh swift our job as investors is to audition the future not invent it so there's plenty of great entrepreneurs to audition i would also say that the velocity of the software supply chain is at warp speed. The amount of software, the number of open source components downloaded last year was like 7 trillion. Uh, Amazon does a build every three seconds of live software. Uh, so it is becoming the platform for everything. So I know that earlier we mentioned security. That's a big issue. We do B2B enterprise investing. I'm also on the investment committee of Seraphim Capital, which does space tech. And the software model is a beautiful model. Uh, it has high gross margins <laughs> and repeat cycle. So we just are auditioning. Every time we think we've seen everything, there's another op 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 entrepreneur that comes in. That, that is the joy of being an early stage investor is you see the future 10 years ahead. Thanks. And Craig? Yeah, I mean, just quickly, I think that what the war in Ukraine has um, highlighted is dependence on fossil fuels by certain markets um, needs us to have technology around the EV ecosystem in related areas. And I think the pandemic, as others have mentioned, um, emphasized the supply chain ability for, for all of us to 
to procure consumer goods effectively. And those are two trends that have accelerated um, with the many entrepreneurs that Anne was was resonating with um, that are whose job it is to to develop the right business model for us to invest in. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Uh, I think that this has been very interesting discussion. The situation is is not easy in the world, but at the same time, I think that in 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 a certain way, it's it's really to look for also new solutions in in many ways. Uh, and uh, it 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 will be definitely also uh, interesting time in the business. So thank you, thank you, uh, everybody, and and thank, thank you. you also for the audience. Bye Thanks. now. Bye bye. Thank you.